Hello, everybody, and welcome to Making Sense of the Digital Society, the speaker series hosted by the Humboldt Institute for Internet and uh, Society and the Federal Agency for Civic Education. It has been running since December 2017 and is coming to an end with tonight's edition. However, this is a twofold event. It also serves as the kickoff for the conference titled AI and Warfare, running until Friday, both here and just around the corner at Humboldt Institute at Französische Straße. I will tell you more about the conference in a moment. As for the structure of this evening, after this welcome address, I will share some words about the speaker series and the conference, as well as, of course, introduce our guest. You will be finally able to listen to tonight's lecture, which will be followed by a conversation between our guests and Jeanette Hofmann. Jeanette is one of the research and founding directors of the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. She's also a political scientist and professor of internet policy at Freie Universität Berlin, FU, and also conducts research at the Berlin Social Science Center, Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, on topics such as global governance, regulation of the internet, and digital transformation. Jeanette really has been central to the series, along with her colleagues Christian Katzenbach in the beginning and Thomas Christian Bechle, uh, who took over, who also co-curated this conference I was mentioning and will be coming back to in a moment. Now, to be precise, making sense of the digital society is not quite finished. Things sometimes, sadly, don't die on the internet, as you know. You can, A, still find everything online. It's kind of a massive compendium actually, including this compendium with podcasts on thematic clusters of the series. B, a book is being prepared by Thomas Bechle and Jeanette Hofmann that will be released sometime next year. And C, there are new formats or series on the horizon likely starting next year as well. So thank you for having me those seven years now as moderator. Um, thank you also to the production team, Christian Graufogel in the beginning, Lena Henkes now, and of course many thanks to Sasha Shire of the Federal Agency. So let's start with a short recap maybe of the speaker series before we return to the present. The names of the partnering institutions that you see here on the banners already hint at what the series has been about. Questions like how societal change is connected to the internet or more broadly to technology in general. AI algorithms and not just generative AI, what we usually hear or read about. And how we can broaden academic or political discourse behind closed doors for the public sphere. Civic education, that's what it's about. Although our distinguished guests have come from various places, I recall China, India, the USA, the UK, also the Netherlands, Italy, and of course Germany, not so many Germans though. Um, and although we have discussed global platforms, cities, and digital infrastructure, the scope has distinctly been European, usually at the end of a session. You can probably guess now that when we addressed the European perspective on the geopolitical race for technology, we focused significantly on regulation and how to shape technology according to civic needs rather than merely corporate or geopolitical ones. Indeed, during those seven years this series has run, we have witnessed considerable changes in European regulation. And by that, I do not only mean the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, you know, the mind and finger numbing process of accepting cookies all day. The GDPR was actually implemented shortly just before the series began. I'm talking or thinking about the Digital Services Act and more recently the AI Act, which although passed is still under construction and subject to, this is Europe, national variations until it is fully implemented. As most of you in the audience tonight are experts in one or the other field that are discussed here, we know that the AI Act is a so-called risk-based regulation. It differentiates between fields of AI that require stricter regulation and others that don't. Surveillance, for example, in the workplace and public places is highly regulated. Regulating global platforms is a bit more complicated, as we have seen also in this series, but as I recall, it has always been of high public interest. When we had, for example, Shoshana Zuboff here four years ago, speaking about surveillance capitalism, the turnout was massive in a very large venue. Also a very nice turnout tonight. Thank you for that. 
We also actually received almost freak numbers on YouTube, well over 300,000 views for the English version and over 50,000 for the German <coughs> translation up to this day. Taylor Swift does still attract slightly more traffic, that might be true, but comparatively speaking, those were numbers that even we found hard to make sense of. So despite the hot topic and the well-known speaker, the algorithms of YouTube played a significant role in pushing the filmed lecture. And here we are entering black box territory. We are in the realm of intransparency. This, of course, and this is why I'm kind of talking about that all the time here, is one of the antagonistic dynamics that I think has haunted this series, often reappearing almost like a specter. Especially with today's algorithm-driven systems and machine learning, we see much more precise and, of course, much faster results than before, but at the same time, we know less about how they come about and how they are processed. So we have simultaneously more certainty and less certainty. As a cultural critic, I would see this as a structurally psychotic situation, a form of paranoia that extends beyond academia and intelligence agencies into the lives of almost everyone. Think about phishing emails, phishing with PH, that continuously flood inboxes, claiming that you have been hacked, that spyware has been installed on your device, and that you should pay a ransom in, big surprise, Bitcoin. Sometimes these emails appear to be sent from your very own account. If you're lucky, your address has only been spoofed or masked, uh, as they call it. Uh, if you're less lucky, some scripts have taken advantage of unsafe settings from your email provider. How do you know if it's just the usual shenanigans or if you have truly been hacked? Especially if you're in the public eye or worse, if your work involves debunking digital disinformation or hate speech or much worse still, if you are critical of an autocratic government. One of the more depressing nights we had in this series was at the end of the pandemic, we all still wore masks, in the audience at least, when Marius Dragomir and Kristina Rosgoni spoke about freedom of expression in Central and Eastern Europe, mainly in Hungary. Our distinguished guest, who made the journey from Princeton, New Jersey, would know all about it, having spent a long time in Hungary and to this day publicly commenting on the similarities between the politics of Viktor Orban and Donald Trump, as well as the think tanks connecting them. I'm pretty sure we will hear about that too tonight. Okay, sorry, this uh, intro is running a bit longer than usual. I hope you understand it is in the nature of the two things we are celebrating tonight, an ending and a beginning. You will hear everything about AI and warfare from tomorrow until Friday at the conference hosted by the Humboldt Institute, the University of Bonn, and the network called MiHuCo, short for Meaningful Human Control, which deals with autonomous weapons systems. The latter is concerned with the modern military aspects of warfare, but as you all know, there is a significant amount of hybrid warfare occurring in the information domain. The conference aims to establish a dialogue between these fields that are often explored separately. This is where the following keynote comes in. Our guest has studied and worked in many places, including New York City, Chicago, Ann Arbor, a really nice university town close to Detroit, and the great swing state of Pennsylvania schools of law with frequent stints in Vienna and other locations east of Vienna, as I said, Hungary. She's now a professor of sociology and international affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School and served as director of the program in law and public affairs at Princeton University. After 1989, she focused her attention on the transformation of countries under Soviet domination into constitutional rule of law states. She will also be contributing to a book about the series due next year that I mentioned earlier. She has, of course, an incredibly long list of academic publications, but you may also see her on TV or read her quotes in the New York Times, as I did for preparing this event. She sometimes even writes for the German Verfassungsblock, also she does so in English, and she's also on the advisory board of the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. I hope we see her discussing different subjects than Donald Trump after the election next month. Tonight's title is, let's see if it applies to the yes after November, the autocrats, no, I'm sorry, democracy at risk, the autocrat spyware. There's still a question mark there. Well, let's hear it. Please welcome Kim Lane Shepelin.
Great, thank you so much and for such a wonderful introduction and to be part of this terrific series. Uh, one of the things I've really felt privileged to, to learn about is to be on the board of the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, where the research projects are invariably fascinating. And for years I've thought, what can I say about this? So my, tonight are preliminary reflections from my experience with the Institute, but also in thinking about the rise of autocracy. So, the autocrat spyware. My talk is gonna be in several parts. So part one is on the ubiquity of spyware. So Hungarian journalist Sabolt Spanyi suspected he was under surveillance. On the way back to Budapest by, by train from a meeting with an important source, he saw a man who was keeping track of him by observing his reflection in the window. The man had gotten on the train when Panyi did, but he did not have a suitcase like the other travelers, and he positioned himself between Panyi and the exit as he stared at Panyi's reflection. As Panyi said later, we call it demonstrative surveillance when they want you to know that you're being followed and they have given you a sign that you should be careful about the information that you have. Later, Panyi discovered that the Hungarian government had infiltrated his phone with powerful spyware, Pegasus. Andras Szabó, Panyi's colleague at the Hungarian investigative journalism website Direct36, found that his phone was also infected. Panyi and Szabó had worked on national security related stories. And in fact, at the time their phones were infected, they were, they were compromised with Pegasus, that is, they were investigating the connections between the Hungarian and Russian governments that flowed through the International Investment Bank, a Russian development bank whose headquarters had been prominently situated in Budapest. Panyi and Sabo had first been put under clumsy physical surveillance designed to deter them, and when they continued their investigations anyway, the Hungarian government turned to Pegasus. Now, Pegasus is a spyware tool manufactured by the Israeli-based NSO group, and that group has close connections with Israeli intelligence. The spyware can be inserted onto a cell phone in a stealthy manner. When it was first invented, Pegasus either took advantage of vulnerabilities uh, in commonly used apps, or it engaged in spear phishing <clears throat> excuse me, which tricks a user into clicking on, an, like clicking on a link and that will install some booby-trapped document. Um, and that puts the software onto the user's phone. Since 2019, however, Pegasus developers have found ways to insinuate the software onto a user's phone through missed calls on WhatsApp, later deleting the record of the missed call so that the user has no way of ever suspecting this method of installation. When installed on a cell phone, Pegasus can see what the user of that cell phone sees, thus performing an end run around the encryption that may otherwise protect communication sent to that phone through apparently secure services like WhatsApp or Signal. Pegasus can exfiltrate contacts and photos read texts and actual messages, email messages, that can note what's on the user's calendar, it can listen in to phone calls, and it can track users wherever they go. It can even turn on the infected phone's microphone and camera for real-time monitoring. Given the intimate relation that people have with their phones these days, Pegasus has access to highly personal details of people's lives. The NSO group reassures us all that Pegasus is only sold to governments and the only limits to Pegasus's reach, however, are those loosely imposed by the private business. Outsiders cannot check whether the NSO group follows its own policies, which includes providing the spyware only to governments unlikely to misuse it. So here's the slide of, from the website of NSO about its values. <laughs> Um, so the NS, NSA group, NSO group reassures us all that, um, that in its own publicity it takes a pioneering approach to applying rigorous ethical standards to everything we do. 
claiming to carry out a structured, in-depth internal review under our human rights policy. But as the NSO's Declaration of Values continues, we believe that success comes by being intrepid. So NSO claims that it's an ethical business, building human rights into all aspects of our work, a quote from their governance slide. And as a deterrent to casual use, tracking people with Pegasus is expensive, with fees depending on the number of users tracked. The New York Times actually saw a price list from NSO in 2016, at which time spying on 10 users would cost 650,000 US dollars, plus a 500,000 US dollar setup fee. 10 extra targets would cost an extra 150,000, but there was a bulk discount. Adding 100 more targets would cost a mere 800,000 US dollars. The Times quoted the NSO sales documents, <clears throat> which bragged that the software provided, quote, unlimited access to a target's mobile device. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with this access to the user's mobile device, the government can, quote, remotely co and covertly collect information about your target's relationships, location, phone, uh, plans, and activities whenever and wherever they are. Best of all, NSO's document added, quote, it leaves no trace whatsoever. So despite all the reassurances, Pegasus has turned up in places that belie the NSO group's stated policies. The Pegasus project was formed by a global consortium of journalists in 2021 after they had received a leak of 50,000 names targeted for Pegasus infiltration, and they found that their list implicated 11 countries that had bought and, and de deployed the spyware. So here's their 11 countries. The list includes dictatorships like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan, countries which one would have imagined the NSO's own standards would have blocked. But it also included backsliding democracies like Hungary, Mexico, and India, which are troubling in a different way because they have governments consolidating power and attacking opponents. The Pegasus Project discovered that users in a much wider range of countries had been targeted by those 11 subscriber states, since there is no requirement, obviously, that the NSO users <coughs> excuse me, only use the spyware inside their own countries. So here's a map of the phones infected with Pegasus based on the Pegasus Project's investigative uh, research. It shows that many people in countries that did not seem to have contacted or contracted directly with the NSO group had phones that were nonetheless infected <coughs> from those 11 countries, right? So for example, in Europe, <coughs> excuse me, Pegasus was discovered to have infiltrated phones in France, Spain, the Netherlands, Belgium, Poland, and the UK. Um, and as you can see, this is, it includes a lot of countries that, shall we say, um, are not democracies, okay? But Pegasus is not the only spyware in circulation. Once the capacity to infect phones by stealth was discovered, other private companies figured out how to copy them. The spyware Predator, with capacity similar to those of Pegasus, infiltrated at least 50 accounts on the social media platforms Twitter, now X, and Facebook between February and June 2023, and they've infected these accounts through infected links. The targets included the President of the European Parliament, the President of Taiwan, members of the US Congress, and the German ambassador to the US, as well as many other officials, academics, and institutions. So unlike Pegasus, which is a closely held Israeli company, Predator's corporate structure is more complicated the spyware is sold through a network of companies called the Entelexa Alliance, which advertises itself as, quote, EU-based and regulated, because the companies that are part of this alliance are located in France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, the Czech Republic, Cyprus, and Hungary, in addition to Switzerland, Israel, North Macedonia, and the United Arab Emirates. An investigation by Amnesty International found that Predator spyware had been sold to at least 25 countries, including Germany, 
Austria, and Switzerland. But the list of purchasers also included Congo, Jordan, Kenya, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, Singapore, the UAE, and Vietnam, including a number of countries to which EU export controls should have blocked the sale. So the fast spread of spyware throughout the EU worried the European Parliament, which created an investigative committee called PEGA. PEGA reported last year that, quote, it can be safely assumed that all member states have purchased or used one or more spyware systems. On the 15th of June, 2023, the Parliament's plenary adopted a PEGA report, <coughs> excuse me, recommending to the Council and Commission measures to control the uses of spyware in the EU, singling out Spain, Poland, Hungary, Greece, and Cyprus for Parliament for particularly egregious misuse and listing specific measures that those countries should take to come back into compliance with EU standards. The Parliament called on the Commission to assess the situation and report back with proposed new legislation to more strictly regulate spyware's use inside the EU. A year later, the Commission wagged its finger at the abusing states, but did not propose a regulatory framework as the Parliament had requested. The Commission's consideration of the topic seemed not to deter any spyware users. Shortly before the Commission issued its warning, German Green MEP Daniel Freund, perhaps the most vocal critic of Hungary in the European Parliament, found that he had received an email with a malicious link that had he clicked on it, would have installed onto his phone Kandiru, a different Israeli company's spyware. Okay, Kandiru is a Tel Aviv-based company that also seems to have strong links with Israeli intelligence. As the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab reported, quote, Kandiru makes efforts to keep its operations, infrastructure, and staff identities opaque to public scrutiny. Like many mercenary spyware corporations, the company reportedly recruits from the ranks of Unit 8200, the Signals Intelligence Unit of the Israeli Defense Forces. As Citizen Lab unraveled evidence of Kandiru's most recent attacks, it concluded that the spyware was being in, used to engage in, quote, extensive targeting of members of civil society, academics, and the media. We observed evidence of targeting infrastructure masquerading as media, advocacy organizations, international organizations, and others. <clears throat> By the way, this kind of masquerading is when the system sets up a website that looks like it mirrors a website you're familiar with. <clears throat> but if you click on that website, it will install malicious software on your device, all without you realizing you've reached a site controlled by this group. All right, so working with Microsoft, whose software Kandiru had exploited, Citizen Lab observed at least 100 victims in Palestine, Israel, Iran, Lebanon, Yemen, Spain, United Kingdom, Turkey, Armenia, and Singapore. I list all these countries just so you see that how widespread the use of this spyware is. Victims included human rights defenders, dissidents, journalists, activists, and politicians. Now, spyware has been implicated in some of the most serious human rights violations of our times. <clears throat> As Fianula Nialain, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Protection of Human Rights While Countering Terrorism, wrote in a blog post accompanying the release of her concluding report in that mandate, the Special Rapporteur on, extrajudi on Extrajudicial Executions has implicated spyware and intelligence gathering on Jamal Khashoggi he was the Washington Post columnist who was killed in the Turkish embassy. So the intelligence gathering on him prior to his murder in 2018. Forensic analysis by the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto has evidenced spyware present on the devices of multiple human rights activists and journalists subjected to torture, unlawful arrest, and physical violence worldwide. In other words, the spyware was used to locate them, find out about their movements, and then they're arrested and tortured. <clears throat> and spyware imposes a chilling effect on civic exchange and political engagement, undermining the rights to privacy, free exp expression, association, and assembly. In short, spyware has gone global and is no longer under the control of democratic governments. 
Rather than protect those governments from terrorists and other rogue actors, it is being used by governments for abusive purposes. And so back to Hungary, where Sabolts Panyi and Andras Sabo have become internationally famous for having been targeted with Pegasus, which has not stopped their brave and penetrating national security reporting. Panyi has now won several major journalism awards for his bravery, most recently the 2024 Free Media Award, which was just awarded a couple of weeks ago. But can journalists targeted with Pegasus actually do their work? As Panyi said recently, it's every journalist who has been targeted's concern that once it's revealed that you were surveilled and even our confidential messages could have been compromised, what, who the hell is going to talk to us in the future? Everyone will think that we're toxic, that we're a liability. And maybe that's one of the points of spyware. Part two. This is not 1984. The ambition of governments to know everything about their potential challengers has long been a fantasy of dystopian fiction. In his famous novel 1984, George Orwell described a society in which every aspect of a person's life was monitored. But the measures used were ham-handed and highly visible. Endless posters said, Big Brother is watching you. The police helicopters swooped low enough to look into windows. The telescreens that watched everyone could not be turned off and provided endless information back to faceless spies while simultaneously announcing propaganda to the masses. The ever-present thought police might be watching everyone all the time, or maybe not. It was impossible to tell. As Orwell's narrator Winston Smith said, quote, you had to live, did live, from the habit that became instinct, in the assumption that every sound you made was overheard, and except in darkness, every movement scrutinized. So we all know the lessons of 1984. It wasn't just in fiction, but in real life, the totalitarian states sought to control everything about their hapless citizens. They wanted to eliminate all individuality and spontaneity, and with them, all resistance. They wanted docility and conformity above all, and mass surveillance was crucial to ensuring that they got both. In the end of the novel, 1984, when the state caught up with Winston Smith's rash acts of secret defiance, it crushed him by using his biggest fears against him. Now, Orwell published his novel in 1949. The 20th century interwar dictatorships that he knew operated on a mass scale and ended in mass slaughter. Adding to Orwell's picture of a society under the absolute domination of an absolute leader, Hannah Arendt's probing analysis of totalitarianism noted that both Stalin and Hitler had aspired to, quote, totalitarian domination which aims at abolishing freedom, even at eliminating, eliminating human spontaneity in general. We can rehash the authoritarianism totalitarianism debate again, of course, but 20th century dictatorships had some unmistakable similarities. The chosen people that the regime believed could be loyal were drafted as cadres working toward a common ideological goal, aided by a secret police to ensure no second thoughts. And in the end, those who were targets of the regime ended up in camps slated for death. Ultimately, the totalitarian state treated its citizens not as individuals, but as a pu mass public to be educated through mass propaganda. And according to Arendt, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and nothing was true. As she continued, mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd. Now, the 20th century dictatorships targeted no less than individuality as such. The massification of society, the idea that people could be addressed and controlled as a whole, led to the bureaucratization of their treatment and ultimately to this relentless demand for obedience. 1984, which fictionalized life in such a regime, put its population under the watchful eyes of telescreens and created a, a world in which it was impossible to know who might agree with your deviant thoughts unless you took a huge risk to find out. 
the point of mass surveillance was to make it dangerous to stand out and impossible to organize with like-minded others. Pegasus, Predator, and Kandiru may make us think that we have returned to the total surveillance for which 1984 serves as a shorthand, but actually we're no longer living in that kind of world. The idea of mass society has gone out of fashion, not least because the reality of mass society has disappeared, at least among countries that purport to be democracies. Instead, decades of social science research has documented that, that along almost all dimensions, um, that, co co that contemporary democracies are falling apart, or at least becoming deconstructed. People have become less likely to belong to groups that intermediate between the state and the individual, like political parties, religious institutions, and social clubs. And people have become more and more reliant on smaller and smaller circles of friends and family, finding refuge and community instead on the internet, where, among other things, they can be anonymous or reinvent themselves as personalities they do not have to maintain IRL, that is, in real life. As the society that we live in changes, so too do the methods of dictators. 20th century dictators controlled mass society through ideological domination and overt mass repression, but now 20th century dictators are doing the opposite. Precisely because they don't want to look like the dictators of the past, the new dictators are atomizing, individuating, and deconstructing social groups so that they can rule over a population of isolates and use ideology not as a political program for mass action, but as pure distraction for entertainment. The technology of dictatorial domination over mass society of the 20th century was the highly visible surveillance of all. By contrast, the technology of dictatorial domination over post-mass or deconstructed society is the 21st century version of this surveillance, which is spyware, in which people are spied on unawares, one person at a time. Spyware is the technology of choice of the new autocrats. Now, this is a big claim, so let me make, provide some evidence to make the case. First, on the deconstruction of society. So in the US, Robert Putnam famously traced the decline of what he calls social capital, that is, the strength of social networks that bind people together. He showed that Americans used to belong to social clubs, political parties, and sports teams. They used to hang out with other people, including over family dinners and with friends. He famously concluded in his famous book, Bowling Alone, published in 2000, that there had been a precipitous drop over the prior quarter century in activities that brought people together in person. Americans used to belong to bowling leagues, and they still actually were bowling, but now they were more likely to do it alone. So was the same thing happening in Europe? Well, it appears so. Take political parties. Almost no matter how you measure it, membership in political parties has declined in most of Europe over the same period that Putnam described as characterized by declining social capital in the US. The picture on the left shows you membership in political parties across a number of different European states. Okay. At the same time, across Europe, the party system itself was shifting so that the two largest parties in each country were receiving a declining share of the votes with voters splitting, splintering across more parties. That's the picture here on the right. Peter Mayer is perhaps our best chronicler of these changes. And as he noted in his 2006 essay, Ruling the Void, which became title of a later book, conventionally, parties are understood to integrate and, if necessary, to mobilize the citizenry. As parties have changed, however, and as the mass party model has faded away, the functions they perform in contemporary societies have also shifted. As he showed, parties that once grew out of social groups um, and social group membership at local level, and so had a grounding in local communities, had changed over the course of the post-war period to become more and more dependent on state funding and a professional class of people who ran them and less embedded in local social ties. So people were still voting, but to paraphrase Putnam, they were voting alone. 
The same sort of deconstruction can be seen in declining attendance at religious services. Across Europe, the number of people who are members of churches or who re regularly attend church services are declining. This is true in both Protestant majority and Catholic majority countries. That's the picture on the upper left. Um, and you know, while women still attend religious services more frequently than men, it's the picture on the right, even their numbers have declined in this crucial number, in this crucial period between the 1960s and the turn of the millennium. What we see is an even more revolutionary kind of um, change and how it is that couples meet. Okay, now this is US data. I would love to find out if there's a comparable European study. And the question is, you know, how do you meet the person you later got married to? Um, and the answer basically is, you know, and until the turn of the millennium, people tended to meet their partners through families or through school. And sometimes by being introduced to friends, through friends, but once the internet took off in the 90s, suddenly meeting online has become by far the most common way that people meet their spouses, which is to say, it's no longer mediated through the intimate social ties that used to bring you together with people who knew the same people you knew. Now you tend to meet them alone online. I could go on, but suffice it to say that the main, that the pattern that Robert Putnam observed in the US seems to be a more general phenomenon in democratic societies. From what we can see of the trends, people spend far less of their time than they used to in organized in-person company of others. In short, the kind of social organization that would give rise to a mass society has disintegrated, and in its place we find people who have fewer and fewer strong social ties. In other words, we now have a post-mass society. All right, part three. Now the autocrats <laughs> come in. All right. So the dictatorships of the 20s and 30s across Europe and up through 1989 in Eastern Europe towered over mass society and gained their power through mass repression, as we've seen. But since the turn of the millennium, the world has witnessed the rise of a new set of dictators as countries that once scored high on the VDEM liberal democracy index, it's an index that measures things like separation of powers, electoral integrity, and respect for rights. That's what this measure measures. High is good, low is bad. Um, and so the countries that used to score fairly high on that have been falling quite far, quite fast. These are the 10 top, or bottom, I suppose. The countries that have fallen the farthest, the past, the fast in the last uh, 10 years or so. Autocrats inside these countries have consolidated power by eliminating checks and balances, packing once independent institutions, especially judiciaries, and putting pressures on the media and the civil sector. Europe is not immune from these trends, as you can see. Hungary, Poland, and more recently, Greece, are among the top backsliders in the world if you look at how quickly democracy is being curtailed. I call these dictators autocrats because they go to great lengths to appear, uh, to actually not appear, like the 20th century dictators we already knew. If they looked like them, we would treat them like them, right? We would say, this is really horrible, okay? So instead, these new autocrats often masquerade as Democrats. Most have come to power through elections that are more or less free and fair, at least the first time. They consolidate their power through law, changing the appointments process for judges, altering the regulatory system for media, fiddling with the election rules. The new autocrats do not use overt force against their opponents until quite late in the game of consolidating power. What they do looks from the outside like a new leader winning an election and then altering the law. Moreover, as, as we've seen, however, the new autocrats are coming to power in a different social context than their predecessors. Where the 20th century dictatorships arose out of highly organized social space in which religious institutions, unions, mass parties, and other forms of large-scale social integration brought people together, the new autocrats are coming to power in a deconstructed society in which social bonds are much looser and in which much interpersonal communication is mediated through devices, and even anonymous. Instead of being armed with centralized mass communication platforms that can reach audiences through one-way messages, the standard mode of communication of the 20th century autocrats, 
the new autocrats are entering a post-mass society in which the dominant forms of communication are personalized. In this new social world, each individual has their own private source of information. Now, where there was once a huge generational gap in the use of the new technologies, including smartphones, that gap has narrowed substantially in recent years across a wide range of countries. If you look at the blue line, those are the older generations. They've now caught up to the younger generations in terms of owning smartphones. And the penetration of smartphones into these societies is getting close to 100%. Okay, and so this is where um, the generations have, have, have uh, grown together. And then the question is, what are people doing on these phones? And that's where the chart at right shows you that overwhelming numbers, that's the percentage in each of those countries that's on at least social, some social media sometime, which is to say this has really become a very uh, dominant form of you know, mass entertainment. And so what are they doing? They're using social media to link with others, displacing in-person connections. So this is the context into which spyware makes its appearance. In many ways, it's the perfect fit for a world in which there are fewer in-person conversations to overhear, fewer meetings to infiltrate, fewer groups to spy on. Instead, these days, people's phones provide the best guide to what their owners do and think, and who is in their networks, and even what they are planning to do next. So people now practically live on screens, OK? According to a 2023 survey, most Europeans spent about one third of their waking hours staring at screens. In many other parts of the world, the numbers are even higher. In fairness, this includes computers as well as phones, but a big chunk of it is phones. The best place for a spy to sit now to find out everything about a person is then right inside the screen. So this is why the, the new autocrats find this spyware terribly convenient. In keeping with their light touch dictatorship in which they announce to the world that they are still democracies and in which they do not engage in overt mass repression or mass human rights violations, spyware allows the new autocrats to keep up the pretense that they are really different from the other dictators. Their societies look and feel free. There are no telescreens or big brother signs. Instead, if you go to a country in which spyware is in frequent use, to, you know, being used by these autocrats to keep tabs on anything that might rattle their rule, you won't be able to tell. In fact, those people whose phones are infi infiltrated can't really tell either. The only way to know for sure is to have cybersecurity experts examine your device and if they find that it's been affected, perform a complex operation to remove it. These are the, this is the Norton, um, you know, uh, company's sort of instructions on how to get rid of Pegasus. Um, of course, spyware technology constant ev constantly evolves to evade detection. I haven't even mentioned the older generation of spyware like FinFisher, which used to be state of the art and has now been supplanted by even more stealthy tools. So we can expect that as new ways to detect spyware become available, the spyware itself will evolve to evade them. Okay. Now, autocrats haven't given up completely on mass surveillance. Just think of all the CCTV cameras combined with facial recognition software that are in use. But spyware has a different logic. It singles individuals out of crowds and combines recognition of that individual with a huge portfolio of private data to allow nearly every aspect of a person's life to be traced in real time. Better yet, from the standpoint of the autocrat, the phone may be the only one in the general vicinity that is targeted, leaving everyone else around the target to believe in the illusion that they still live in a country that guarantees their freedom. Right? The point is that it feels free unless your phone is targeted. Now, it is this property that makes spyware the ally of autocrats who are invested in trying to make their societies appear normal. While the world of 1984 made its repression highly visible and all were affected without possibility of escape, the world of spyware singles out particular precise targets while leaving the rest of the social environment untouched. Final part, spyware's law.
So here we are in Europe where the general data protection regulation gives everyone's right, everyone rights in their data. Europeans are by now accustomed to those pop-up screens on all of our devices that we heard about earlier, asking permission to collect data with generous options to opt out. I can assure you Americans have no such protections. <laughs> Um, in fact, these, regulation, these, these rights are guaranteed not only by regulation, but also in the constitution of the EU itself, the treaties. So here's language from the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which guarantees the right to respect for private and family communications and the right to the protection of personal data. The rights are stated without qualification, as if they apply to everyone in Europe all the time. But Article 51 of the Charter specifies that these rights are only in force in member states, quote, only when they are implementing EU law. So when is that? Okay, back to the treaties. So Article 16 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union says that everyone has the right to the protection of personal data concerning them. You think, aha, this is actually, not only do you have a right in the Charter of Rights, but you actually have a provision in the, one of the central treaties. Surely such data rights protect against spyware, right? So how can they be deployed legally within the EU? Well, the answer lies in the carve-outs to the right, and in particular, the derogation or exception for national security that starts with Article 16.2 and then continues in coded language in Article 39 of the Treaty on European Union. Article 39, if you read it, makes no sense if you don't actually know where you are in the treaties, because it says, in this particular chapter, then the states can sort of figure out what to do. What it's really telling you is that there are special rules that apply to this chapter, and this chapter includes, very prominently, national security. So if surveillance is done by a member state in the name of national security, it becomes none of the EU's business, but a matter only for national control. So every state that deploys spyware against its challengers in the EU claims to be carrying out the surveillance in the name of national security, and that exempts them from the constraints of EU law, by and large. Okay. Now, this gives rise to the curious phenomenon in which private companies that make the spyware sell that spyware to governments, and in doing so, largely avoid regulation themselves when those governments claim that they are using spyware in the name of national security. The EU has an export control ban on the sale of spyware to abusive third countries, and one would think that this applies to EU-based entities that constitute, for example, the Intellexa group that has Predator, for example. Um, but it seems that those export controls have been evaded when Intellexa sells its Predator spyware to abusive third countries through one of its overseas subsidiaries. In short, the spyware industry is not effectively regulated inside the EU, even when the EU's much vaunted protection of private data would seem to make you think you are protected. Okay, so what's happening? So we're starting to get a little bit of attention paid to this by some of the European courts. So this is a decision from 2020 of the European Court of Justice. Um, it, the, the EU, the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, recognizes that this is a problem, and they've started building a framework for eventually trying to have a say. So in this judgment, which was a response to a preliminary reference from the Investigative Powers Tribunal in the UK, that's a very specialized tribunal that handles primarily terrorism cases, okay? They send this reference, this is shortly before Brexit. The ECJ found that member states are not permitted to require internet service providers to transmit personal data, and the key word here is indiscriminately, to the security and intelligence services in the name of national security. So this was like bulk surveillance. Everything that goes through an ISP's, you know, sort of wires would get transmitted to uh, British intelligence. Okay, and so in short, what counts as national security for the purposes of determining a legitimate derogation from the general principles of EU law is something that the e ECJ has now said it can review. Okay, so this is actually an important thing because before this decision, you didn't know if the ECJ was just saying national security, none of our business, or national security, let's look and see whether it's really national security. And this is the decision where they start to say maybe we can have a look. Okay. Now, this challenge um, was to bulk data collection, 
in which the UK security services gathered a huge amount of personal data without any individualized suspicion of the, of the person whose data was, were collected. And so this decision applies primarily in this context where many of the people whose data is snarfed up have no specific suspicion that the intelligence services have. Okay, now something similar is happening over at the European Court of Human Rights, which armed with Article 8 of the European Convention protecting the right to private life, also found that the UK's bulk data collection project violated the rights of those whose data were collected. And I love the, the name of the case, Big Brother Watch and Others versus the United Kingdom. Um, so this was a case, 2021 case, and the, here the um, ECHR also found the UK's system of requiring internet service providers to turn over everything failed a proportionality test. And so, and they said the system didn't have sufficient safeguards for processing data. So here again, the courts are starting to look at what are the safeguards, what are the systems, do you really know whether the person whose information you're gathering has done something, okay? And so we come to Germany, where just a couple of weeks ago, the German Federal Constitutional Court, um, which has been particularly vigilant on the idea of data protection. I might say I think data protection rules are stronger in Germany than anywhere else in Europe, but even so, in this decision two weeks ago, the court was looking at the Federal Criminal Police Office Act um, authorizing covert surveillance, so putting people under surveillance without telling them. The court said that covert surveillance was in principle permissible. <laughs> which is to say, yes, you can do it, but it imposed a number of restrictions on the practice. In particular, such surveillance could only be used when the suspect was, quote, sufficiently likely to be connected to potential crimes and when the data so collected could only be retained for the duration of the particular criminal case. So there has to be a prior suspicion. You can't just gather information on everyone. This is kind of the German rule. And there has to be a system whoops, system of protections. All right. So how is spyware legal <laughs> after all of this? And with this cascade of court decisions, one would think that spyware would at least be on the run a little bit, because the courts look like they're trying to regulate at least this bulk collection. But such is not the case. Precisely because spyware is exactly not used in bulk collection. It's not used to gather information of everybody, right? And presently, it's only used against targeted individuals. It escapes much of this legal net that's already been built. Because what's to prevent a country from saying, ah, oh, we know about this person. They are personally a national security threat. And right now, all of the regulation is around this sort of algorithmic bulk collection of stuff rather than about targeted surveillance. And it is far easier you know, for states to claim they're using spyware for a legitimate national security reason if they're singling out their targets one at a time. So spyware may lend itself to abuse, but at the moment, there isn't really a legal framework that really gets at that. Okay, now here's the thing that keeps me awake at night. So spyware is to the 20th century autocrat what blanket surveillance was to the 20th century dictator. It's precisely why it's been so hard for observers to recognize a 21st century autocrat when they see one. After all, if dictatorships are supposed to look like Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Russia, or for that matter, since here we are in Berlin, like the Stasi's East Germany, then contemporary Hungary or Poland under the Peace Party or Mexico in the last several years or India, that these countries don't look like dictatorships. They don't follow that model. They don't round up the opposition and imprison them. They don't use instruments of mass repression. They don't use, uh, and they don't engage in massable, massive and visible human rights violations. Instead, they look on the surface like normal countries. Perhaps this is why support for a strong leader who can operate without the pesky constraints of judicial review or parliamentary democracy is increasing in many democratic countries. In other words, dictators don't look so bad. And these are two charts from the, the Pew Research Center. The one on the left asks this question about whether having a strong leader that can make decisions without interference from parliament or the courts would be a good or bad way of governing the country. And what you see is that you know, there, there's a fringe that thinks that, but it wasn't a huge number in any of these societies that were asked just in 2017. A similar question was asked earlier this year by Pew 
and this is the percent who say that rule by a strong leader or the military would be a good way of governing their country. And what you see if you compare the two numbers is that support for some kind of dictatorship or authoritarian regime is increasing in virtually all of these countries. It could be a function of question wording, but I would have thought actually the second question was worse than the first one. It looks like from all the other measures we see that support for autocracy um, is increasing. All right, so support for autocracy may be on the rise because the 21st century autocrats don't rely on the visible signs of an overt police state any longer. Instead of massifying repression in mass societies, the new autocrats atomize repression in deconstructed societies. Inserting spyware onto the phones of key people who might organize against them allows the autocrat to scoop up compromising information, which they can either use for very targeted arrests and harassment, or which, and this is I think increasingly common, at least in the places I know well, they can release this information anonymously through social media destroying reputations, setting some members of a political opposition against each other, and dissolving any remaining solidarity that an effective opposition needs to build to be a serious threat to the regime. In other words, you take those weak social ties and you make them weaker by spreading all this kind of disinformation that may have come from people's phones. Of course, they can also just make it up, but some of the stuff that actually has a grounding is even more damaging. So in our modern bowling alone societies where individuals were already alienated from each other and don't have the density of social ties they may have once had, it is easy to keep people apart by stoking rumors and distributing fake news. So in backsliding democracies and even more fully in autocratic regimes, spyware is no longer a dual use technology that might legitimately catch terrorists, criminals, and spies. That's always the government's rationales for these things. It has become the dominant new technology of autocracy, gaining its power precisely through its invisibility and its capacity for targeting individuals in a crowd. The legal net of regulation that has started to close in around bulk surveillance allows spyware to slip through, and so there are now few effective legal controls on spyware's use, not even in Europe, which takes data protection more seriously than any other place in the world. But the controls that presently exist, there are a few, and they're primarily political rather than legal. After the Pegasus Project and the work of organizations like the Citizen Lab in Canada started exposing the abuses of spyware, political pressures on the distribution of these spyware companies grew. And so this map shows you a bunch of states that have had their licenses to Pegasus revoked. <laughs> so Hungary, Poland, Mexico, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE had their licenses to use Pegasus revoked by the NSL group in August of 2022, after facing pressure from the EU. So not by law, but just by you know, saying, threatening them, basically. But this can work both ways. Ukraine was denied a license to Pegasus because the NSO feared that it would target Russia, which had successfully lobbied the NSO group to deny a license to Estonia some years earlier which is to say these private spyware companies can be pressured from all sides. So right now, political pressures from many quarters, which are causing the private businesses that sell spyware to adjust their practices, allow rogue countries to still find a way. And this may be, for example, why Hungary seems to have shifted its spyware of choice from Pegasus, which it used to target Panyi and others, to Kandiru, which it was using to target Daniel Freund. Okay. And so... Now to the conclusion. So if states can legally insert powerful new weapons directly into people's pockets to shadow them and monitor everything they do, then autocracy, this is how autocracy gains new victories. This is why the remaining democracies in the world need to stand up for the human rights of individuals to escape state control through targeted surveillance. In my view, democratic governments in my view, democratic governments should treat the creation of spyware the way they treat the unwelcome invention of particularly cruel weapons of warfare. In the past, good states have backed international conventions regulating chemical weapons, biological weapons, 
landmines and incendiary weapons, even though those might have been useful to some states fighting a war. But the consequences were so horrific that they warranted the technology being banned. In my view, the same states that banned those weapons should get behind the creation of an international law movement that regulates the use of spyware. Law, of course, cannot make bad things in the world disappear. But law can try to establish and enforce new norms. We are all now in notice that the spyware has become the autocrat's weapon of choice, which is why democratic governments need to act now before spyware becomes so universal that none of us is safe. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you for this excellent talk. Um, thank you also for making it so interdisciplinary, which is very important for what we are doing here. Um, the aspect that I found probably most interesting is um, your observation that there is a correspondence between the transformation of society on the one hand, which becomes in many ways more individualized, and a transformation of surveillance, which by targeting individuals also becomes more individualized. But at the same time, you say mass surveillance still takes place. So perhaps you could sort of um, elaborate a bit more on this relationship between the change you see in society and the change you observe with regard to spyware or say technology of surveillance in general. Yeah, so is this on? You can hear? Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, so mass surveillance is still there. It's not that it's disappeared, but it's changed its character. So we're, we're all on cameras all the time, and we've more or less gotten used to it. And we've more or less gotten used to the mass surveillance not being a technique of repression. It's not the 1984 kind of mass surveillance. Um, and so I think, you know, what's, what's happening is that the fact, I mean, I'm, what I, as most of you know, what I've been mostly writing about is the rise of these new autocrats. And what's so interesting to me about them is the way in which they've been able to really control power, centralize power, and, you know, rig the election rules so they can't ever be thrown out of office. They really are beyond the accountability of democratic publics. And yet, a lot of observers still give them credit for looking like democratic societies. Right? How is that possible? You know, people I know go to Hungary and they say, I had a great vacation. It was such a lovely place. People look so happy. They're sitting in cafes. This is not a dictatorship, right? And so the question is how it is that a, that a government manages to maintain this kind of absolute control while not having any of that absolute control be terribly visible. And so that's where I think this spyware comes in um, because it's exactly how the government can monitor what people who are likely to cause it trouble are doing without making that visible to any of the tourists who show up, right? And so it's exactly part of this like soft touch dictatorship where the deal is, you know, you let us run everything and we will stay in power forever and we'll let you have a life, you know? We'll let you have enough freedom that you don't really feel terribly constrained. And so everyone looks at these new societies and says, well, that's not what a dictatorship looks like. We know what that looks like. And that's how they've been able to kind of stay in power as long as they have. So I think spyware is like one of those ingredients in this light touch dictatorship. Um, and the fact that you see Pegasus and Kandiru and, you know, the, and Predator being used really a lot in these backsliding democracies, you know, tells me that it's really an important tool for them. Absolute control through targeted surveillance, mm -hmm. or is it absolute control through a combination 
of, say, mass surveillance and targeted surveillance? Yeah, so the mass surveillance um, is also intimidating in some ways. So again, the country I know best is, is Hungary. So one of the things that Hungary has done is that it's, it now seems to be in possession of Chinese facial recognition technology. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it uses that in combination with, well, they have these cameras on the top of police cars that are like the Google Street View cameras mm -hmm. that do the 360 degree sweeps. Um, and so when those cameras kind of go slowly, with those cars with the cameras on top, go slowly through demonstrations, for example, they're picking up who these people are in the middles of crowds mm -hmm. uh, and then matching them to facial recognition mm -hmm. technology. Um, there was at least one demonstration, some people in the audience may recall, there was this university called Central European University, which was based in Budapest, now it's in Vienna. Um, when there were still demonstrations to keep it in Budapest, so lots of students turned out from all over the city. And the, and the police used these Google Street View cameras to pass through the crowds. And then there was one night after a demonstration when at least 50 people that we know of got phone calls at three in the morning mm -hmm. where there was nobody on the other end. And that told everybody, you were captured on camera and we know who you are. And when they call at three in the morning, what they're trying to do is to figure out where you live, like where your cell phone is. Um, so it's clear that this, you know, that's a more mass surveillance technique and that's actually being used. Um, in Hungary as well, but it's not being used so much. Um, nothing awful happened to any of those people, <laughs> right? It was just like, we know you're there. It wasn't like what's happening to the people who are having Pegasus put on their phones, where they lose their jobs, they get harassed. It's something where they, they really are in danger of not being able to maintain the lives that they had. So mass surveillance still has a, has a role, um, but this, spyware is just, it's, it's really insidious. It, again, in the Hungarian case, the people that were targeted were journalists, lawyers. Mm -hmm. They wanted to hear the conversation between lawyers and their clients, particularly mm -hmm. lawyers who were dealing with asylum cases. They actually put um, the spyware on some of their own people. In particular, one person who had been negotiating with the Russian government over the the um, improvements that were supposed to be made to this power plant that Russia was going to be providing the technology for, they bugged their own person to make sure that he didn't say anything to the Russian government that they didn't want to have said. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they were, well anyway. The point is that, you know, when this technology is possible and you don't know until later that you've been bugged, it also has this effect of everybody wondering whether their phone is bugged. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's, that has a, another kind of widespread effect. Um, let me just mention this one other technology just in use, again, since Hungary is always my case. What the government used to do before it started using Pegasus um, was that there was this odd system, and I don't know how they did it technologically, but they would put you know, members of the political opposition under surveillance. And the way that you knew you were under surveillance is, you know, suppose I were to call you because we're friends, were in the opposition. What I would get when I called you was not you, but a recording of our last phone conversation. Mm -hmm. They did that to a lot of people, and including some members of the European Parliament from Hungary, uh, for example. Um, and so that told you, that's this demonstrative surveillance that Sabolc Pani was talking about. They would do that first to intimidate people, mm -hmm. and then they went to Pegasus. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a, it's, I'm sorry for the long way around, but the point is that it's a combination of surveillance techniques and a lot of it is just to make people nervous and to make people realize that anything they say or do could be monitored mm -hmm. and that by itself has a kind of deterrent effect. And the fact that you don't know is part of it. So let's turn to the link between these spy technologies and autocracies. Yeah. The map you showed showed mm -hmm. also countries like Germany, mm -hmm. which is not an autocracy, and most studies wouldn't even um, categorize it as a backsliding democracy, right. Right. but still um, that kind of technology is used here. So how strong is the link between the type of political regime and the use of this technology? Yeah, so I don't think spyware necessarily turns a good government bad. 
it makes a government turning bad worse. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think it hasn't been regulated is that the technology is so useful to governments that think of themselves mm -hmm. as good. You know, they think, ah, oh, we know some bad guys. We want to put this, I mean, this is how you, how you, you know, control specific people that you have a suspicion about. And if you have a national security service that is trustworthy and democratically accountable and plays by the rules, mm -hmm. then I could imagine there being some legitimate uses. But think even of Germany's history in this, Germany being the best regulated system. Okay, so if something can happen on here. Paper. It, on paper, well that's exactly what I'm gonna say. So remember when it was discovered that the BND had been cooperating with the National Security Agency and Germany was actually snarfing up large amounts of internet communications at the Americans' behest. Mm -hmm. That was discovered after the fact in a highly regulated system. So now that's not spyware directly, but it shows you that the intelligence services, once they decide that something is important, can very easily evade regulation. And the less detectable the technology, the easier it is for them to evade detection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the maps that we have of the abuses of spyware come from the fact that if you're in a country that's backsliding, you might suspect your phone is, you know, is infiltrated, and then you have to go find out. So this is, you know, we don't have like a random sample of phones to find out, you know, what's mm -hmm. happening. So, and when the technology is that secret, you don't see the good uses very much. Um, but the bad uses are so overwhelming, and also attributable even to some countries that you wouldn't yet think of as backsliders. Mm -hmm. And it's such a destructive technology that this is what makes me wonder whether it can ever really be controlled. Particularly if prices predictably, predictably will fall, right? Right, and then the prices will fall. What you see already is that every time one spyware manufacturer gets called out, so like everybody in the room probably knows about Pegasus, mm -hmm. but you might not have known about Kandiru, right? That's the one that's now popping up to take its place. And if Kandiru gets outed with human rights violations, there'll be a third one. <laughs> you know, like they just keep shifting their corporate forms in order to wash clean the record of abuse. Mm -hmm. And what's really, I mean, so here's, the, here's another thing that bothers me about spyware. This is, these are private technologies. They're probably invented in conjunction with military uses. But then they're spun off and they're sold by private companies. And private companies can pick up and move more easily than individuals. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the spyware is sold through companies that are operating in networks or operating from states that are not putting serious controls on their exports. Um, and so as a result, what you get is a private business. I showed you some of the NSO slides, you know, pledging. They said, we have this wonderful internal human rights policy. You know, we screen all the countries to make sure that they're not human rights violators. And then you find out that Saudi Arabia has Pegasus, and you're thinking, did they steal it? Did they, I mean, but they can't, because the way it works is that you buy the, the license, and then you have to pay for each person that you surveil, and you're paying the NSO group. Mm -hmm. So the NSO group knows exactly who's being surveilled, and NSO group is under no regulatory structure that is limiting what it can do. So that's the worry. It's this public-private combination. Yeah. You know, if this were like most military technologies, which are developed by states, and then kept under state regulation, you could use some of the pressures of international law to go after states that were, that were propagating or selling. You know, that's why I tried to make the analogy at the end to chemical, biological weapons, landmines, and incendiary weapons, because when those are deployed by states, you know who did it and you can bring international sanctions and pressures to bear on them for using unlawful methods of warfare. This is, what do you, what do, you do against a commercial company mm -hmm. that can reinvent itself in an autocratic state? <laughs> Which is kind of what's been happening. So we have a unregulated territory actually in a double sense. First of all, we have this claim of national security which carves yeah. out huge yeah loopholes of all EU regulation at the That's moment right. and this 
a second dimension, you have the fact that a lot of it is developed by private sector companies, mm -hmm. which escape in different ways, the right. kind of uh, regulation. Exactly. So what chance do you see that this will be eventually reined in by constitutional courts? And which one would you bet on would make a move in that direction? You mentioned already a few examples. Yeah. Well, so, I, so first of all, we really need a different framework for thinking about this public-private stuff. And the fact that so many of the new technology tools are being invented by private businesses for military uses. I mean, this has been a outsourcing of military technology mm -hmm is a long-standing problem, and this also has some of that same quality. So where will the regulation come from? Well, for one thing, I'm hoping that the Court of Justice uh, of the European Union will start to say, okay, so states get to have a free pass when they claim national security. Mm -hmm. Who gets to say whether that's a proper claim or not? So I see the ECJ moving slowly in that direction. In fact, the European Court of Human Rights is already there in a way with regard to the declaration of emergencies. So if you have a state of emergency in a, in a Council of Europe member state, the country in question is supposed to file a derogation with the Council of Europe. A derogation meaning we're going to have to infringe some rights in the state of emergency, but here are the exact rights, mm -hmm. here's how much, you know, you can monitor. And then the European Court of Human Rights has a series of decisions in which they say, was this a situation in which a state of emergency was properly declared? Right? So I can imagine that jurisprudence starting mm -hmm. to close in on, is this really a legitimate target? Is this something that is a threat to national security or just a threat to this government? But it also requires sort of the intention to go that way, right? It does. It absolutely does. So some strategic thinking and litigating, I suppose. Absolutely. So you need the cases. I mean, the other place, and one reason why I love talking about this here is, of course, Germany, where the Constitutional Court has actually been far more, um, has, has been far more concerned mm -hmm. about data protection mm -hmm. and has seen a lot of the consequences. You know, that said, the German court's approach has been largely procedural. Like, yes, you can do this as long as, mm -hmm. you know, six people look at it and it, there's appeal to a judge and you tell the person after the fact if they were under surveillance. And so it's sort of a procedural protection. And I'm not sure that's going to be enough in these cases. Um, and again, Germany is also not likely, I mean, you know, maybe I have an unduly rosy picture, but I don't think it's likely to be the kind of government that's going to put Pegasus on journalists' phones and human rights defenders and lawyers' phones. I think there's a sufficiently strong legal culture in these mm -hmm. institutions. They won't do that. So you might not get the cases coming up here yeah. of the obvious abuses. So last question before we open it up to the floor, and that is a more general question regarding democratic backsliding. You are an expert on Hungary, have observed this country going down the drains over uh, the last uh, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the literature on democratic backsliding and populism, mm -hmm. there is a sort of very bleak expectation of mm -hmm. what is to come. Mm -hmm. And some people would even say, uh, Orban is sort of the pioneer and others will follow um, in Europe, but also beyond. Do you mm -hmm. share this view? Well, unfortunately, you know, I've I, I followed Viktor Orban for a very long time. And, you know, the way that he took over power in Hungary was truly extraordinary. And he's now being used as a model for mm -hmm. other dictators, and particularly now the U.S., actually. So the way that Orban came to power in 2010, he'd been out of power for eight years. He came back in in 2010. He'd used those eight years to develop a plan, a legal roadmap, for how to consolidate power in the hands of the prime minister, by neutralizing all independent institutions, and the parliament, and the courts, and so on. He did that by hiring private law firms to draft this big plan. And when he came to power, he just was shoveling legislation, I mean, tens of thousands of pages of new laws past the parliament in the first three years. 
By 2013, it was all over. He had basically controlled everything that mattered. So now we have this case coming along that I know well, which is the US. Donald Trump was elected. It was a surprise to everyone. Donald Trump himself is neither a lawyer nor disciplined in any way. But what he did in his first term, I hope his last term as president, um, is that he outsourced to a group called the Federalist Society the process of picking judges. And they were absolutely relentless at putting in place movement conservatives who were dedicated to overturning a lot of things that had been taken for granted in US constitutional law, and that's exactly what's happened. The Supreme Court is basically packed. Trump looked at that and said, aha, uh -huh, well, he's not gonna do that kind of stuff. Let's outsource it. So he's outsourced the plan for a potential second term of office to a group called the Heritage Foundation, another foundation which compiled a group of conservatives to put together a roadmap for Trump's second term. It turns out Viktor Orban was involved in writing that document because Viktor Orban's English language propaganda outfit called the Danube Institute had literally a contract with Heritage. Their people have been going back and forth. When you read this Project 2025, as, as it's called, Blueprint for the Trump Second Term, it's again, it's planning for the second term while you're out of office, all the legal things you're gonna do when you come in. Mm. And of course, the Hungarian and US governments are organized differently, so you don't do exactly the same things. But the key move for Orban and the key move for Trump would be changing the civil service law, firing the tops of the entire bureaucracy, installing all your people who have been pre-trained, then reinstating civil service protections, and then you can order the whole bureaucracy to do stuff. That's in this plan. So all of this is telling me, and, and Orban brags about it, and Trump brags about it. If you saw, he called out Orban during the one and only debate that he had with, with Kamala Harris. Um, and so, you know, it's clear that there's a bond there. And Orban is going around and doing this with other places. He's been very involved in the legal changes in Israel. He was very involved, obviously, in coaching his buddies in Poland. Um, and so he's now the, the guy who knows how to do this stuff. And what I worry about is that, you know, given that Orban's now discovered spyware, as one of the things he's used against the people who might organize against him. I mean, basically what they do is they use this information and then they send in plants to the po political parties that are rising up against them to cause fights and cause them all to break up. And so they, he always knows what the opposition's doing, so they can't ever surprise him. And I worry about what happens when that technology, which the US I'm surely also has, will start to realize, think of you know the CIA with Trump telling it what to do, right? That's the other worry. One reason why I put up that slide about the increasing support for autocracy is that countries you would never have imagined would have any traction for autocracy. Take the Netherlands, for example. You know, Austria, you know, has always had a few problems, but think of, you know, the rise of, I'm sorry, <laughs> Austrians over there. Um, but, you know, think of the rise of the off day here. You know, I mean, this is now, everyone here is having the conversation. Is this thinkable? So now think about what happens when you have this technology in a well-behaved government and the government becomes less well-behaved because of the way voters are voting. That's what we're facing now in the US. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a very long explanation and if you wanna know all about Project 2025, ask me, that's what I do at home, so is try to fight that. <laughs> so up to the audience, questions? I see a hand there. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, should I stand up or is this okay? Yeah, it's okay, but you could uh, mention your name, perhaps. Yeah. So, hello, it's a pleasure to be here. I am Marina Bajeto. I am a PhD student from Brazil. Uh -huh. I'm a very much fan of your work, Professor Shapley. I actually translated one of your articles to Portuguese. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's been a double pleasure to be here. And I would have a lot of questions, but I'm just gonna focus on one of them and then make a short commentary. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought it was very interesting and I keep thinking uh, if maybe we're, because uh, this is also uh, coming from a lot of uh, different academic circles about like how society is fragmenting and digitalizing is making us um, more lonely and uh, fragmented in general. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, 
aren't we uh, maybe idealizing too much the past, the mm -hmm. social past, our social experiences and the experiences in social um, mass society? So this would be one point, and mm -hmm. being too pessimistic about um, digital ones. Mm -hmm. So um, it can also be nice for mobilization strategies, and also very um, abusive and wrong. Uh, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and regarding to this point, I'm thinking, especially in the case of Brazil, Bolsonaro Brazil. Yeah. So he also mobilized a lot in social network, and not only through spyware, and that made people feel they are not lonely. Like they right. had a lot of right. uh, Telegram chat groups, Discord mm -hmm. groups, and so mm -hmm. uh, isn't this also social ties? Um, right. Yeah, so this is a point, and just a little bit of a, a commentary mm -hmm. about um, in Brazil, uh, a very used software in Bolsonaro government was First Mile, which is also from uh, Israeli um, intelligence. So I don't mm -hmm. know if it's something also very broadly used, but since it was not in the presentation, I'm curious about it. And thank you again, it was amazing to hear you, and I'm looking forward to the debate. Well, first of all, thank you so much, and Brazil is just, since I'm in Europe, I was talking about Europe, but Brazil is just such an interesting case. It's, I mean, it's a case where actually the courts rose up and really defended democracy and pushed back the autocratic threat for a while, so, you know, I think that's a really good example of what courts can do, you know, in a time of crisis. Are we romanticizing the past? Of course we're romanticizing the past. Um, on the other hand, there is a sense in which the past was really different, right? So the question is, you know, how is it different when um, most interactions were person to person? Didn't mean people were not lonely, but it meant that you sort of had a, a more 360 degree knowledge of other people. Um, and that it was harder to create fake identities, I guess. Um, and maybe that's a romantic picture, but I think when you when you're trying to when you're a dictator trying to control a society like that, you're controlling people who know each other well enough to potentially be able to recognize each other's signals. Um, and so it was a harder job, and that was why the repression was much more severe, I think. If you have people who you know are living through screens and who, who basically are perfectly happy as long as the economy is free, even if politics isn't, um, it takes much less effort to repress a population like that. I guess that's the point of saying that these atomized connections are just kind of easy to take over and control. People don't may not even notice um, the number of people who just are not involved in politics at all. And that's part of the point. The idea is to kind of demobilize people politically. And so when you talk about Bolsonaro and all the people that he's brought into his movement, it's a social movement and not a party, right? It's all people directly, and it's like Trump in the US, it's people relating directly to him and not so much to each other, you know? And so this, again, provides a kind of avenue of influence that does start to look a little bit more like, you know, the kind of 1984 scenario, but it's something where you're not building the horizontal networks that can stand up, because if you're gonna mobilize against this person, where do you start, right? I mean, I, I see this in Hungary, I, my friends in Brazil tell me the same. How do you know how to form the social movement that works against this? Now, you know, Brazil had the advantage of a political party that had been knocked down but hadn't been killed, so it could come back. Lula came back. I mean, there was a well-known figure who could run again. Same in Poland, where Donald Tusk came back. The opposition parties hadn't been crushed. But if the repression lasts long enough and you start to really break up all the political parties, or they splinter and they start fighting with each other, then when you get somebody who's an aspirational autocrat, you can't really fight back against them. You know, So that's the worry, is that the dictators, the dictators of today don't have to engage in mass repression because there is no mass to repress. <laughs> and it's just a lot easier to, to repress people in these one-off light touch, I mean light touch to the rest of the world, not to the person that's targeted, but these, they can just be very specific about who they target, and that's enough to control everything. So that's my worry. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, there is another one. Thank you. 
Also for me, thank you so much for this very insightful talk. I'm Marika Peterson. I'm an alumna of uh, the EFSR's Master Students uh, Program for Peace and Security Studies. And I was, I want to connect to what you just said. Um, so me growing up with Facebook, etc., I was constantly raised to saying they'll read anything. Everything you post online will be read by private companies and they'll use it for advertised targeting, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, if we are constantly faced with this view of everything you're saying is used by private companies, are we getting so used that it's just, okay, then the state's also reason. I mean, in Germany, it's a stable democracy. It's fine. What's the worst thing they could do? So that we just, it's normalized for us to think that everything we're posting online, everything we're using online, our phone, etc., is used, that it just doesn't matter to us enough. So it's very hard to gain attention, for example, for the new security packages proposed by the German government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ah, well, thank you. So first of all, don't be so secure in your democracy. The U.S. used to think of itself as, you know, the one that taught democracy to the rest of the world, and look, here we are. Um, so it doesn't, I mean, what's kind of alarming is that it doesn't take a lot to rattle a stable democracy, you know? And I, I think what's been interesting about following the German debate is the kind of alarm and mobilization around the rise of the far right. Um, that said, the far right is doing pretty well in certain parts of Germany, right? So, and I see, like with the new constitutional amendment or the new... Uh, amendments to the law in the Constitutional Court, people thinking ahead about how do you preserve the institutions that are really the watchdogs, you know, of democracy in Germany. So, you know, I do think that there are a, a lot of features here that I wish I saw in more countries. Um, but that said, you know, the way that this technology, the, I mean, at the internet, I should remind everybody, started as a military project. Right? It started in the labs of military agencies that were trying to figure out a new backbone for communication, and then it gets privatized. And now the major players are private companies that control more wealth than any other private companies on Earth. And because they operate transnationally, it's the same problem with X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, or any of the Instagram social media platforms, Blue Sky, whatever. It's hard to regulate them because they are transnational. So they've taken advantage of the global reach of this technology to be able to locate themselves wherever they have the least regulation. You know, so if you wonder why all the you know, data companies and the internet um, service providers are in Ireland, it was because everybody knew that their data protection officer would look the other way and everything kind of migrated to the country that would have the least enforcement. So when you're dealing with private businesses in a, in a world of transnational regulation, the businesses are usually ahead of the regulators and they're moving around to other places. And given the dependence, I mean, part of the reason for showing you all that stuff about screen time and you know penetration of cell phones and penetration of social media is that these have become absolute essentials in people's daily lives. And it's a space in which governments have found, even you know, uh, big entities like the EU have found extremely difficult to regulate. So spyware is the leading abusive edge of it. But if you back up into who governs all these platforms, which we rely on and which we tell our most intimate thoughts to, right? Just think of the history of your Google searches, you know, and what that tells you about your life, right? It would just be such a map. To everything you were thinking about, right? And so what does it mean to disclose that much information in the hands of private companies? I don't think we've hit the regulatory model yet. Uh, and I think, you know, the spyware debate, I hope at least opens this question of what to do when potentially really abusive technology may not be abused at the moment, but the structure of the of the space in which this thing operates doesn't lend itself well to regulation. One last question, perhaps, before we wrap up. Yeah, here's someone. If, if it looks like we're squinting, it's because the lights are very bright and we can't quite yeah. see you all. Thank you, Kim, for the uh, really awesome lecture. Okay. Uh, I used to live in New York and I'm in Helsinki now, but I'm really happy to be here for this conference. Um, we've been talking about the demand side of yeah. spyware 
And I wanted to focus a bit on the supply side because mm -hmm. it's very clear that most of the companies that are private companies are doing this are part of the military industrial complex in Israel. Right. And I'm concerned about how one can regulate that because these regulations, mm -hmm. as you said, do not affect the demand, the, 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 the suppliers. So mm -hmm. are there other mechanisms using sanctions, for example, or using the ICC as a tool to bring a criminal justice, to, to essentially use this as a violation of human rights, uh, especially from journalists and other actors, uh, to file a case and have that used as a legal mechanism to restrict the ability for these companies to operate? Yeah, it's such a good question. So, you know, first of all, there's the, let's start with the Israeli issue. So. It does seem like a lot of this spyware grew out of the fact that Israel's now become a tech hub. And it's become a tech hub in part because of the integration of military and civilian research. Um, by the way, the US was the prior hub that did all of that exactly. You know, the internet was invented as DARPA, which was the Defense Department's you know, communications network, and then it got generalized out from there. So this merger of private business with military technology has happened in other countries before. Um, one of the dilemmas, of course, is that, and, and you see why it's happened in Israel, because, shall we say, security has been a hot-button issue in Israel for a long time. Uh, and so you see why they would do it. Um, so the worry is what happens when Israel is simply not following international law. We've got the ICJ on record. We've got the ICC, which may or may not finally issue the criminal indictments. Um, there was a terrific piece in The Guardian the other day by um, Meti Hassan, who's a, an American journalist, about the war that Israel's declared on the UN. You know, most recently telling all the peacekeepers to get out of the way so they can come on through when the peacekeepers are supposed to be holding a line set by the UN. And this is after, anyway, I can go through all the ways that Israel's been attacking the UN since the war broke out. So you've got an actor that actually is proudly announcing it's not following international law. And so, and also in a context which, of course, as we know in Germany, is also hot button for other reasons, um, which has generated, shall we say, quite a lot of social contestation. Not so clear how you regulate Israel if they are um, ignoring international law and if the U.S. keeps backing them up. Right? So there's a real politique element of this about how it is you manage that. So what I'm thinking is that I would rather talk about the spyware as if it's a military technology than as a civilian intelligence service use because it grows out of exactly military uses. It's military research that gave rise to it. And so that's why I said sort of at the end, why don't we think of it as being like landmines or incendiary weapons or something like that, where you get the controls that come from the origins of this in military um, research. And again, you know, it, law doesn't come from nowhere, right? You have to build up to it, and the first thing you have to do is to publicize the abuses and to publicize the, the really quite horrific potentials of particular forms of technology. And in this particular hot button moment, when Israel is expanding the war it's fighting, and when it's, shall we say, not particularly honoring the need to protect civilian targets. Um, this is gonna be a hard time to do that, just because it's the regulation of spyware seems like the least of our problems. Um, but it seems to me we have to start the conversation about where this is coming from. What kind of world do we wanna live in? Where the, where the object that is with us all the time becomes the thing that spies on us, right? Isn't there some free zone in which people know that they can communicate with the world, because now so much of our communication is mediated, without having that be a site of military-grade technology that exposes everything about who we are, right? So we have to start the conversation, and then we'll see. But it is very hard for exactly the reasons you describe, and because we're in the middle of a war, the world is in the middle of a war in which, shall we say, international law is already on the back foot. Yeah, on that doomed <laughs> note. Um. We'll just end with something not particularly controversial. <laughs> yeah, um, please, say yeah. something that gives us optimism towards okay. the end. Yeah, so here's the thing, right? How much time do you spend on screens? And you're not there because you're a prisoner of them. 
You're there because you see it as providing something absolutely crucial in your life. And that's why it's worth fighting. You know, it's like fighting a freedom fight for technology. Not that technology wants to be free and therefore controlled by all these you know, tech bros who are like libertarians, but the technology needs to be free because the more dependent we are on it, the more crucial it is that it has human rights built into it, mm -hmm. right? rather than just being following the logic of whatever it is that people without our interests at heart can get us to pay attention to. Right? So this is really a call for democratizing the technology, and that may require rethinking public and private and regulatory systems and how it is we build rights into the center of this technology rather than having them be the casualty of the technology. That was meant to be hopeful. So this is great. <laughs> we end with the call to democratize technology. I think we couldn't put it better. And now before we end, I would like to really thank Toby Müller for seven years of sort of not only moderating um, the lecture series, but also making it accessible to lots of people who were interested and were at times perhaps struggling with the complexity of the issues. You did a really good job, so thank you for that. And I want to say, also say thank you to the high game management, which has, without any flaw, uh, organized this uh, in the best possible way. So thank you to you all and also to Kim, and we'll see what will follow from this. Thank you. Thank you.